good afternoon, good morning, wherever you may be, because I noticed that we have a very, very global audience today. As, as I said earlier, uh, thank you for staying with us through today's conference, for those, those of you that who are rejoining. And for those of you who are just joining, our, if this is your first session, then I would like to say welcome, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference today. So my name is Eric, and I am the principal consultant of RDI Worldwide. I will be the host for you today uh, on this session on diversity, inclusion, and skills for the future. So now this is a really, really exciting and important topic for us in RDI, because if you have been following our LinkedIn, and if you've been visiting our website recently, then you would know you have noticed that diversity and inclusion is something that we've been putting a lot of focus on when it comes to the research that we do and also when it comes to okay good afternoon ladies and gentlemen so welcome to our webinar and wherever you may be uh, I'd like to give you a warm welcome. And for those of you that who have just joined us, this, if this is your first session, then welcome. And if you have been following us today at this conference, and I would just like to thank you very much for staying with us. And I hope you have been enjoying some of our session that we have been delivering for you today. So uh, my name is Eric and I'm the principal consultant of RGI Worldwide. And I will be your host today for this particular session on diversity, inclusion, and skills for the future. Now, when we designed this webinar, this is a topic that means a lot to me personally, and this is also a topic that means a great deal to our team in RDI Worldwide. Because if you have been following our LinkedIn, and if you have been visiting our website, then you would have noticed that uh, one of our core focus when it comes to our research and also when it comes to the service that we, that we provide. Uh, diversity is, is one of the key focus when it comes to that. More specifically, when it comes to age diversity and inclusion in the workplace in Korea. And if you have not been following our LinkedIn and our website, then I do sincerely hope that you would do so after this webinar and after today, because there's just so much content that we'd like to share with you when it comes to this particular topic. And with that, then I would like to bring you to today's speakers, uh, Lisa Mills, who is going to have prepared a presentation for us regarding diversity, inclusion, and skills for the future. So Lisa prepared a wonderful presentation on how really, right, if you look at the speakers lineup for today, and also if you look at the, if you have the chance to look at the participant of today, then you realize that, uh, diversity really is not a choice. Diversity is the reality right now that we're facing. However, more than that, when it comes to creating a workplace, or when it comes to being an HR professional, what choice we have is the inclusion part that when it comes to diversity and inclusion, that inclusion is a choice that we need to make if we want to move on to drive our business forward. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Lisa in a moment. Uh, I would like to just give her a brief introduction. So Lisa is a highly respected and accomplished HR professional in both the APEC region and in Europe. So Lisa has worked in Korea and a regional role. And of, and of course, she has also worked in UK where she's based right now. Uh, she has a very, very successful track record in delivering business objective driven HR changes. Uh, in project changes, including organizational design, leadership development, and, and so on and so forth. And most of the projects are in organizations that have well over 10,000 employees worldwide. So without further ado, I would just like to hand it over to Lisa. So Lisa, thank you very much uh, for being here today. I'm very, very excited to hear from you. I, I've looked at the presentation. There's a lot of interesting topic that I think our participant will enjoy. Hi, Eric. <clears throat> thank you for the introduction. And uh, good 
good morning, obviously, from the UK, but good evening from those of you that are on a different time uh, time, time scale. I, I was going to say, start speaking a little bit of Korean. I remember a little bit from my days of being in Korea, but um, it's more about asking for wine and where the bathroom is. So I'm kind of not sure it works really on here, but I will say I'm going to say for all of those, those of you in Korea today. Um, so thank you. Um, I'm just going to just put my initial screen on so I, you can kind of see where we, oops. Okay, hopefully you can all see my screen now. Um, so thank you for asking me to join your conference today and I'm really excited to be here and clearly with uh, lots of very talented professionals and it's encouraging to know that people want to find out a bit more about diversity and inclusion and what it can mean for their businesses. And the, you know, future skills and diversity and inclusion are actually more closely aligned than you think they are. And today you're going to hear a bit about what future fit leadership capability looks like and how you weave inclusive behaviours within, within your business leadership. So if we kick off, I would like to share a story about my experience with, with DNI because I think it's um, very profound and it was quite transformational and I think it's important to hear how it can really transform a business um, that, um, that really consider the, the benefits of diversity and inclusion. So six years ago, I was working for a very large corporate uh, organisation that operated in 10 countries worldwide. They employed around about 450,000 people globally, so a big company. Um, and whilst it was a, a UK based business, obviously it had expanded at that time into numerous countries across Europe and Asia. Um, and I was asked to look at the worldwide uh, diversity and inclusion strategy. And whilst the uh, company were working extremely hard, like many businesses are on diversity and inclusion, what was apparent to me is that it was being driven by the KPIs, the, the key performance, the numbers, and also the external pressures. Um, and that really what was determine, determining their overall strategy at that time. And I very quickly thought about this and thought, well, actually, we actually should be listening to the voices of the 450,000 people that work for the company and the millions of customers that shop every day with the business. And that really should be the thing that would determine the strategy. And what was in place at the time was not particularly very diverse as it was very UK centric and focused on the UK core market and didn't necessarily consider global pressures and differences and cultural differences. And what you find when companies are trying to tackle diversity and inclusion today, they tend to do two things. The first one is that they will throw money at the issue if they have it. Um, and that may look like recruiting a diversity director or, or, or some other diversity um, colleague. Uh, or they pay expensive consultants. I don't come into that category, by the way, but uh, they then also may consider paying expensive consultants and they are expensive to bring in their expertise. The other area is that, that they tend to, to tackle is training. And they're clearly this is important, but it's not the only way. And it's not all about the metrics and the percentage. If you had no money at all and no ability to conduct training, all I would ask is that you have a conversation. Just start a conversation about what diversity and inclusion means to those in your organisation and you'll get a variety of responses that will inform your people and inclusion agenda. The worst thing you could do is say nothing. So on this journey, we identified some core uh, areas to focus on. And I really thought about this because I think it's important to keep things simple. I noticed that the company at the time were trying to work on a hundred things, but achieving very little. So I wanted to just kind of break that down and say, let's just think about what are the key areas that we need to focus on. And for me, there were three that were really apparent. It was about having strength in the foundations. It was about creating opportunities. And it was about brand and reputation and brand leadership. 
So I needed to really understand what diversity and inclusion meant for all of the countries that we operated in as it's so different. You know, what diversity and inclusion means in Poland is very different to what it means in Malaysia, Korea, Thailand, uh, you know, any, any of the other areas that we operated in. So it was really important to understand that. It was super important, and I really can't emphasize this enough, to really engage the senior leadership and the exec. Um, and this is, this is, it has to come from the top down. It's, it's, it's really important that, that it starts at that level. Otherwise, whatever you do and you, the way you tackle it will be pointless. And then it was coming up with a really sim simple, effective, action oriented plan that did provide local vision. So those three core areas around strong foundations, I called brilliant basics. So it's having great systems that really recognise inclusion. It's having super policies that recognise inclusion and great processes. And inclusion is thread for all of those. So that could be anything from the way that we recruit, the way that we induct people, the way that we train, the way that we align our policies. So including inclusion threads through everything we do. Then there was a bit about opportunity, creating opportunity. So it was making sure that leaders understood how to spot potential, how to notice potential, and actually not just spot people that are exactly just like them, which, is, which was a very common trait. Actively learning, actively training, raising awareness, and really helping people to understand that whoever they are, whatever they do, wherever they work, they can realise their potential. And then thirdly, it was about brand leadership, and it was all really around brand and trust. So what's our corporate responsibility and how does inclusion affect our reputation? Because we all know if our employees feel listened to, respected and included, then they're going to do the same to the customer. It just re is really about nurturing the organisational brand. So they were the core strategic pillars. And then I worked with each country to overlay their kind of local vision and local challenges. Now, interesting to do this in a company that, and I'm sure some of you can really relate to this, to do this in a company that are data and KPI numbers driven, I knew I needed to get their attention quickly to provoke some action. And at the time, one of the areas of inclusion that was a particular concern was having female talent in senior positions, and there were lots of external pressures around that too. So I shared with the senior leadership team some data, and this showed some benchmarking that we'd pre the previous year would carried out on all of our global directors. And I think at the time there was about 170 global directors, and they were benchmarked against 10 competencies. Uh, things like strategic thinking, things like commercial acumen, judgment, delivering results, and so on. And what was really super interesting is that the women significantly outperformed the men in every single measure, apart from self-assurance. And when I say significantly, I, do, I really do mean significantly. So um, it was really quite shocking. And there was stunned silence for a little while, because when you then looked at the succession planning, the men actually in our succession plans were all ready for bigger roles pretty much between now and the next three months time and the women were two years away. So it immediately provoked quite an interesting reaction and it was very clear actually that everyone was just following the process and not using their own judgment and having a very stereotypical view. And I kind of like to use the this analogy to kind of bring this to life a little bit is that is it OK to throw litter on the floor? Of course it's not, but it still happens. Right. One person throws litter on the floor, then another person throws litter on the floor, then another person throws litter on the floor. It escalates. Little things that are allowed to happen become a bigger issue. You need to keep your environment clean culturally to stop other people from littering too. So after sharing this data, everyone was given the autonomy to revisit their talent conversations. 
and the company shifted the number of females within the senior leadership team and it literally increased by about 5% literally overnight because they opened their minds up, they stopped making judgments um, and they embraced difference. And it's really essential to use the data you have to inform your agenda and provoke conversation and be clear of the benefits if you do that well and what's the impact if you ignore it. Everyone has probably carried out their own research and having a, about having a diverse and inclusive workforce. And there are clearly very obvious benefits that come from having a diver, diverse workforce. There's a significant connection between diversity and financial performance. It improves creati creativity and decision making. Companies that with a, with a clearer, greater focus on, on inclusion show lower levels of turnover and absenteeism, um, greater employee engagement and loyalty, and interesting in, in the UK, I was looking at some, some details the other day, but in the UK alone, 80% of purchasing decisions are made by women. By 2025, women, which is only four years away, <laughs> women are expected to own 60% of all personal wealth and control 400 million pounds more per week in expenditure than men. Therefore, having women in senior roles will have a much better understanding of their markets when they're the ones that are making expenditure decisions. We also know that when people apply for jobs, they actively seek out companies that have a diverse workforce and a strong inclusion culture. And of course, diverse workforces encourage diverse customers and they begin to trust your brand and they feel comfortable interacting with your company. So you have to ask yourself, if there are all these benefits, then why don't we do it? When you um, look at this picture, I wonder how it makes you feel. Maybe sad, maybe angry, maybe disappointed, and maybe upset. This is why it's so important to understand that businesses can be diverse, but that does not necessarily mean they are inclusive. I've always really loved this quote actually from um, Verna Myers, diversity is being invited to the party and inclusion is being asked to dance. It really does sum it up quite nicely. By not asking your workforce to dance, just think for a moment what you may be missing out on. This is one of the issues um, when we talk about a business can be diverse and not necessarily inclusive. It really hit home for me. And I kept hearing the term unconscious bias bounded around and some of you may be familiar with the term, but I kept hearing everyone talking about unconscious bias and conscious bias. And this is about um, being aware of what your biases are. And I've always felt really strongly when I kept hearing it that this, we shouldn't be using that term as I felt like it was saying, as long as I'm aware of my biases, then that's okay, right? Wrong. I made, I flipped this term on its head and I would only talk about conscious inclusion. So people thinking I'm consciously going to ensure everyone in my team is recognised for their difference and their contribution. And, and understanding those differences, I'm not going to read through these and I'm sure these are, are not a necessarily a surprise to anybody, but understanding them differences and they present themselves in so many ways. And there are some very obvious minority groups out there when we talk about, you know, religion, ethnicity, race, uh, nationality, very obvious gender. But there are also lots of less obvious differences. Um, and I feel like or businesses really need to think about those because you may be missing amazing opportunities if you don't tap into some of those obvious differences. So, for example, if you look at the top one, like thinking styles, um, this could be about an introvert versus an extrovert. The way they work, the way they do business, the way they behave is very different. And I remember being in a talent planning meeting once talking about one of my team who was just super talented. 
And one of the senior directors in the room said, well, she's OK, isn't she? But she's very quiet. Um, now, clearly, that doesn't necessarily mean she doesn't have potential. So, yes, she is very quiet, but she clearly had the skills and the potential to be able to do more and to do a bigger job. And needless to say, um, an interesting offline conversation took place after that session. So, so just really thinking about these styles and thinking about the less obvious is just really, really important in businesses. And Eric just alluded to this as well around uh, around diversity inclusion. But often what happens is that companies place so much emphasis on the what in their business, what needs to be achieved and when, what results do we need to see, what profits, profits is it going to drive, what's the objective? And that's always a very, a very much a core focus for a lot of industries. What we miss the opportunity to do is describe the why and the how. And I had lots of success with this in my experience and my journey and my story around inclusion. So be, being very clear about the why, why is it essential to do this now? Why are we talking about this now? Why is it important? The what, what does the organisation need us to deliver? What's our objective? What is it that we need to achieve? And the how, which is probably just as important as the other two, if not more so, how do we want our leaders and our employees to behave? What leadership do we need to demonstrate to make sure this is successful? As, as Eric mentioned, diversity is the reality. It's always around us and it's going to always surround us, but inclusion is a choice. So as an organisation, how are you helping employees make the right choices? And that's where the focus probably would need, you'd need to want to spend your time. And this is, um, I wanted to share this uh, with you. Um, I'm sorry if it looks a little bit busy. I'll try, I try to kind of keep it as succinct and simple as I could, but I just felt that this was really important because this is really critical to understand the stages that help you to get to this top right hand corner sweet spot. And the way that just if you look at this very crudely, it's about the management of me, so how do I look after myself? How do I manage my own balance, my mind talk? How do I make sure I'm responsive? It's the management of others. So how I lead others, manage conflict. How do we build trusted relationships? How do I influence them and engage them? And how do I really understand more about what they do and why they do what they do? And it's also then about awareness of me. The more I understand about myself, then I think you become much more emotionally intelligent. I've done lots and lots of one-to-one -one work with some very senior leaders, and I can honestly put my hand on my heart and say, the leaders with low self-awareness tend to have very low emotional intelligence too. So this is why it's in the graph, because I think that's super important, is understanding yourself, under having that real self-assessment and understanding what you're good at, what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses, and how you tackle those as well. And then you get to that top right-hand corner, which is your sweet spot, which is awareness of others. I now understand others, I understand myself, I'm aware of myself, but I now understand and I'm aware of other people. And this is where you build great empathy, you've got, you've got open-minded, you're curious, you're, you, you really seek out others' opinions and you find others' strengths and talents. And when you start here and get to that top right-hand box, you naturally become much more culturally intelligent, which all plays a huge part in diversity and inclusion. And I've just, there's a funny little equation at the top there, which you may be looking at. So again, some may be familiar with this, but I always kind of describe this as, it's about the IQ shifting to the EQ, shifting to the CQ. So the IQ is your academic, your academic, so how your intelligence, right? So it's my, it's my own, academic intelligence to then shift to the eq which is your emotional intelligence so how you then start to really understand other people and how you connect with other people and how you understand other people starts to build emotional intelligence and the absolute sweet spot is when you get to the cq 
So you have academic intelligence, you have emotional intelligence, and you get to the CQ, which is cultural intelligence. So you will start to really understand individuals and what they stand for and, and really start to build clarity and knowledge of other people. So I, ju I just wanted to share because I think it's a really quite a, an interesting uh, model to really be aware of. And then um, in all of the work that I've done on diversity and inclusion, it was very apparent that great inclusive leaders possess very similar traits. And when it and when if you want to ensure that leaders consistently deliver inclusion, then we, we would need to be thinking about these traits. And we have I have seen from some of my own research that this absolutely builds competitor advantage. And it's quite difficult, I, I understand, because it's you don't get a very strong uh, measure uh, return on investment like you would do. It's not it's not so tangible, right? But it does build competitor advantage based on some of those um, advantages that I shared with you recent just now. And this is because many industries are driven by KPIs. And as I mentioned, so many businesses don't measure the how, which is the behaviours. They just measure the really the what. So why are these? So what are these key behaviours, and what what is it that a successful inclusive leader would need? So very clearly, commitment. It's about leaders really believing that creating an environment and a welcoming culture absolutely begins with them. So it does sit about its ownership as well, and they have much, they do set obviously possess a very strong um, responsibility for change. They have courage. Inclusive leaders demonstrate courage in two very distinct ways. Firstly, they aren't afraid to challenge entrenched attitudes and practices that affect inclusion, nor are they afraid to display humility by acknowledging any of their personal limita limitations. They're consciously inclusive. They exert considerable effort to identify their own biases and they learn how to prevent them from influencing their decisions. They're curious, they're open-minded, they have a passion for learning, they, they question respectfully, they really listen, intently listen, and they have a desire for exposure to different ideas and opinions. And it's this, the curiosity, the, it, it is about curiosity, it isn't about confrontation. They're culturally intelligent leaders and they're able to really change and adapt their styles to respond to different and varying cultural norms. Culturally intelligent leaders who are typically extroverted will make an effort to show restraint when doing business with those whose cultures is maybe more modest or maybe more humble. And this goes back to my point about shifting from IQ to CQ. It's about building that clarity of knowledge. And also the final one is around collaborative. So they create an environment where individuals feel empowered to express their opinions freely with the group. And they realize that diversity and inclusion of thinking is, is critical for effective collaboration. So everything you've heard so far is a direct link to future leadership. The implications are that effective future leadership will be more about coaching, engaging others, inspiring people and orchestrating teams as opposed to being directive and controlling business information flow. Directive styles and allocating work will become a thing of the past. The world is changing. The way we do our jobs today is, is not how we will be doing them in the future. So understanding what is in the pipeline will help us to better prepare for that. And we've all seen that in the past year with COVID, how our lives, how worlds, our jobs have changed. And that's the same for everyone. Um, it's important to just make sure that you keep in mind that inclusion threads through everything you do and it threads through to this point. And there is clearly a necessity for inclusive leadership. And you see how it links with future fit capability of our leaders. And it's also important to remember I call this ABC to always be cultivating. You need to focus not just on the contemporary, the competencies that you require uh, employees to do, but also on the environment that individuals will be working in, what type of environment that you will create for people and having a continuous learning program to enhance skills, 
keep em employees thinking and judgment up to date so they do become naturally consciously inclusive leaders and you have a workforce who do not litter so um it's in it's key i've just put these few questions up and i'm sure we can share these with you after these slides if it's helpful it's really key to understand how your business is evolving to help you to identify where your focus should be on future skills and i'd really encourage each of you to ask these questions back in your organization these would provoke some very interesting responses and help you to shape your forward agenda and your strategy and actually doesn't cost anything to do it either. It's important to remember it's not an option to opt out of being inclusive and it's not an option not to be part of it. So everyone should open their minds, embrace the change and reap the rewards because they will come. So thank you all for listening. I hope you were all able to find one or two things, little nuggets in there that maybe could support your organisation's um, journey and um open for any questions i'm going to stop sharing my screen as well now there we go. thank you very much lisa for your presentation really interesting thing uh point you have made there a couple of things i really agree with specifically you mentioned about how sometimes recruiters they would spot talent that, that are similar to them in relation to the unconscious bias that they have, either it's a gender thing or even just work style. I think that that makes sometimes that it really does the organization a discredit when they missed out on certain talents that were actually quite different from them personally. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so we have some questions there uh, from, from some of our participants. Um, so one of the, I think you mentioned a little bit about KPI, how you, from your, from your story, how you link up with the KPI, yeah. with diversity and inclusion, but a specific question is how, how should HR professional do, what can they do to influence their leaders, their CEO, their managing directors a little bit better when it comes to putting a focus on diversity and, and, and inclusion, diversity and inclusion. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think um, I would always say use your data to show your current position. Data, data is real um, and it can be super impactful. And, and what you then can do is really think about how does this data benchmark against other industries? You know, we've got to be really honest. Businesses are competitive, right? <laughs> so everyone, everyone wants to be at the top or wants to want to be the best. So it's really interesting when you use the data that to then show how you may ben benchmark against other industries and then describing the benefits if you can give this more focus. And it was interesting that when I worked um, at Tesco, actually, where we recorded a video from actual employees who were talking about inclusion at Tesco. They were telling their story. They were sharing their lived experiences. And it had, and I showed the video to the exec, interestingly. So that, in, that impact of that was, was really, really interesting. And actually Google did something similar, actually. They recorded um, stories from employees that captured times when they felt they couldn't be themselves. It was just a black screen. There were no faces. It was just voices and little stories, not big dramas, but this approach was really, really powerful and really, really brought the message home. So that, that kind of quite visual, real reality, along with some data and some benchmarking, can really help HR professionals to influence and engage senior leaders and business leaders and executive teams. So, so, so take the both analytic approach and also a storytelling emotional real life, like story real, approach. real life stories absolutely that, that's great um i have one question from a participant uh i think you can answer that question i cannot definitely so so in relation to some of the work that you have done with women in leadership position and with women uh, agenda diversity and inclusion so the question is uh, women independently might not be able to change the preconception or prejudgment that they have or we have some somehow they have in the workplace so mm -hmm. how can we work on this together as, uh, as 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 women 
Yeah, I mean, so I've seen lots of different approaches to this, actually. Um, so some organisations, I've been doing some work with another organisation actually recently um, who have introduced a women in leadership programme. Um, and this is where, you know, like minded female professionals come together and support and share stories and develop and whatever it is that they may they may choose to do so that has that has definitely been successful i personally am not a huge fan of, of women's programs personally uh, because i feel like it becomes a little bit of a, like an exclusive group and i think i think there's more about how you bring the men as well into the conversations to really understand how important women are in senior positions in business and the difference that that can bring um, and some of that may be through some you know interventions from women's women's programs but I, th I find it's more about how um, women connect use mentors use have great mentors um, have an opportunity to really showcase their skills um, but we do need to help women to be better at the self-assurance. They've got to sell themselves more. We know that women had had do ha add huge, huge contributions in business, um, but they don't necessarily shout about it so much. And they always say that, interestingly, uh, men are men typically apply for jobs two years too soon, and women typically apply for jobs two years too late so they kind of like leave themselves um, too much of a gap really so it's a bit more about building that confidence assurance and belief um, and helping other people to be able to see that in them too so I think you, you talked about building self-assurance one of the skills that's important uh, yeah. I, I think we can segue into the next question is what would be the top let's say the top three skills a workshop should prepare themselves for when it comes to uh, diversity and inclusion in, in your opinion yeah I mean uh, you know as I said I think looking ahead the world as we said the world is changing right so the way that the skills we need today will be different in the future um, I don't I think that for the need for diversity and inclusion there's so many skills but if I had to kind of pinpoint down to three I would say collaboration is absolutely critical um, collab if you find ways to collaborate it breaks down silos it encourages people to get together and connect it allows people to give insight and different perspectives and individuals feel empowered then to be able to express their views and express their opinions so I think collaboration would definitely be out there for me um, I think building curiosity so um, you've heard a little bit about that from the presentation. It's, it's about building the skills of curiosity, which are about really listening intently, not just lis like listening, watching body language and really, really listening and seeing uh, what others, what other people are saying, respectfully questioning, welcoming, you know, finding an environment that really welcomes and encourages new ideas, creative thinking different opinions and maybe some risk as well so try let's try some new things and then the third one for me without a doubt would be about cultural intelligence so I would think it's about how you help people to make that shift from I'm intelligent to I'm culturally intelligent and then really reaching that sweet spot and you can teach leaders that for me that's about how you can teach leaders to flex their styles so that they use a different style to really help them to build clarity and knowledge about other people. Thank you. And, and I like that is all foundation skills that you talked about. Yeah, like, like you didn't mention about we should do diversity training. I think in the beginning you say company, you very often they just throw money at a consultant to do a diversity training or to do an unconscious bias training, which is really popular, I know, uh, yeah. in, in certain sector. But it's all about building up the foundation skill one step at a time before absolutely. you can even have the conversation on let's talk about diversity and inclusion absolutely absolutely those foundations are really critical i've uh, got a question so often young boys and girls are discouraged from certain vocations so recruiters literally don't have enough diversity of qualified candidate to be able to hire with a full diversity so what, what would be your recommendation for to overcome that sometimes yeah, I mean, um, we had... That would be we, a little bit more Korean-specific situation. I think there's some certain roles that has a certain amount of uh, preconception on gender. 
I think we have definitely yeah. had that before. Yeah, sure. I mean, we had interestingly, uh, we had some experiences with this actually with um, cultures from people from uh, an, from an Indian uh, background, where um, working in shops wasn't um, good enough for the parents, right? So there was a bit of a pride thing, right? It was kind of like, well, you've got to got to go and be a doctor, surely. You know, you can't work at a shop. <laughs> um, so they were very, they were really discouraged by the families and you know from people that were like, well, actually, I want to progress and I want to have a career there. Um, so I think where so where we got to with things like that is to is was about raising awareness. So we actually, interestingly, um, in areas where that was a, quite a big issue. Uh, we held open days for parents of people that wanted, I know this sounds really weird and it is a bit, it is a bit random, uh, but it made a significant difference because we kind of then got the parents in and said, let us talk to you about what your children, you know, well, they're not children, they're young adults, right? What your children could experience. This is what they could potentially earn. This is the benefits that you could see. This is the opportunity that they could have. Um, and that had a huge impact actually when we were recruiting in local areas and had a huge impact in with with, it, with recruiting some of uh, people from that demographics where it was quite largely an Indian demographic in, in certain parts of the UK. Um, and I think, you know, for recruiters, I think we, we I know from working with recruiters as well, for me, uh, it was really important that we had um, diverse, balanced shortlists. Now, obviously, I appreciate as a recruiter, you've got to get to that point first. You have to be able to attract them in the first place. But um, I think it, for me, it's about really displaying the, the company, the brand, the reputation um, and all of those things. You know, we know from especially from like millennials, the reason that they want to come and work for companies you know, now today is because they are diverse and it's because they offer great opportunity and it's because they're flexible and it's because they give people autonomy and ownership. Um, and it's how do you then play on those things to really attract the right people into into roles? Great, thank, thank you. And I agree that the whole employee experience has to be showcased that this is the right kind of experience for the potential yeah. candidate. I think that is something that more i think we have to think a little bit more about just the job itself the person will do but look at the overall experience the person will have when it comes to the environment that they work in the people that they interact with including including team member bosses and customers as well right i think yes. these all becoming increasingly important absolutely okay so we have a question from a participant just came in so it would be really nice if you could recommend a workshop where we can learn more about inclusion self-assurance managing mind talk or <coughs> cultural intelligence yeah um i mean i i, uh, I do run that workshops with all of those things uh, those are elements and areas that you know to be fair um there is lots of stuff online which, which give you some really great models and some really interesting uh, data. But yeah, maybe Eric, I can just have a think about that and maybe share with yeah. you any particular key so, links and things. So, that so the, the person who asked that question, if you DM me your email address, we'll follow up on that. If sure. you direct yeah. message me your, your email address, Lisa and I will follow up on you. Yeah, on the detail. absolutely. No problem at all. So a couple more questions. So I think so, so a little bit regarding convincing the business leader. So there's a lot of upside when it comes to diversity factor from a company perspective. Uh, what is the single biggest upside potential when it comes to the gender, age, and other when it comes to diversity in, in, in your experience? Um, so ju just explain that a bit more, Eric. What so, you're so I think what they, that person meant is from a company perspective, Okay. Let's say you can get more ideas. You can, you can, you, you can. Uh, there's a return on investment on diversity and inclusion. Yes. Uh, but for, for in your in your like in order to build a good business, case, what, what do you think is the biggest contributor to that? Um, I think. Um, mm, I think it depends on the company. Um, so. If it's a company that are very numbers, KPI, results driven, then you have to use data and benchmarking because that, that will be the thing that will get you the cut through. 
if it's a company that are already very culturally aware um, and very aware of kind of their whole business surrounding, then I think it's much more about focusing on the, the, the added benefits that it can bring to the business and to the company. Um, so I think it does depend on how the company is and how, how ready they are to receive inclusion into their business. Right, I think it does depending on the business objectives. Mm. And I, I think you raise a really good point, even though when you work for a big com global company, yeah. you have a corporate objectives or mandate of diversity. I think at the end, you still have to talk to individual country. So when yeah. it comes to Korea, what does it mean for diversity for you, right? Because it could be a big step if you just go, let's go high, let's have a certain amount of percentage of 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 uh, of, of, of foreigner in the company. So it, it would not make sense for the business. It might even draw back on the business performances, right? So absolutely. You have to take into consideration or not. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, just mentioning Korea, you know, as an example for that, you know, Korea. Uh, the Korean business where I was when I was working there, they they are very driven by numbers and success. Um, but in a way that kind of made it a little bit easier actually to to kind of integrate them by showing them the data and showing them how where they benchmarked. Um, but I you know I I did find in Korea particularly that wasn't just the only thing I needed to do was look at the numbers and the benchmarking. I needed to play to their cultural strengths in Korea. So I knowing that typically in Korea they're very driven, they're very committed, they really take ownership and accountability. They can be super competitive at times. So when I was talking about the benefits of doing this in the business in Korea. Um, I would also talk to them about what part do they play, how will you lead the way with this, what could a diverse workforce really look like, and really getting them to name them for themselves because they became much, much more engaged in doing so. So I kind of used a combination of both actually in Korea. So it's really understanding the, the counterpart when it's trying to influence that, that become a huge yeah. part of, of of the process so we got time for one more question so what are you what, what is your perspective of language on especially you've worked in a global environment uh, what is your perspective on language diversity like should english be the default language uh do we have to be inclusive and diversity when it comes to work uh work language uh, language in the workplace well okay this is a very interesting question i do have some views on this actually um so I think dependent on where somebody works, there should, you know, if it's, if it's, let's just say, if it's a Korean business, then the Korean language is clearly going to be, in Korea, is going to be um, the, the default language that everyone would use. However, it wouldn't stop you from having somebody who uses a different language from recruiting, some, from recruiting someone else. It's about having the best person for the job. Someone once said to me, interestingly, is just because it, it was really interesting. It was um, when I was actually going to work um, over in the States and there was a ve it was a very um, Spanish uh, community, lots and lots of Spanish speakers there. Um, and someone once said to me, just because they can speak um, fluently, can speak uh, English, even though they're in a Spanish, very Spanish uh, area, that doesn't mean to say that they're necessarily good. And it was very true, right? It was about me having an open mind and judgment to be able to say, it's okay that if people speak another language, I think, I think it's always useful to try and speak the language of the country where you're operating from. But I don't think it's essential that that should be an issue. And I, again, I use my experiences when, and Eric, you'll probably remember some of this as well, but using my experiences when we were doing things like um, assessment days, uh, for, for future directors, uh, all different nationalities from all different parts of the world, uh, we actually wanted them to speak in the language when they were doing those assessment days that they felt comfortable in. So we would like, if it was someone from Korea, we would line them up with a Korean assessor because I think trying to force somebody who's Korean to express themselves in another language that's not their natural first language 
they wouldn't necessarily come across as strong as somebody who was doing it with their first language. So it was really important to really recognise that and give them that choice. You know, we go about choice, give them that choice to say, how would you like to, to, to deliver this? Because it's important that you express it in the way that you feel comfortable with. So it is for me about choice. I agree. I think in the previous session, Peter Fisher, he mentioned about when it comes to measuring the recruiting people or picking the right talent. Uh, sometimes you have to look at it, not just what they can do and how they do it, similar to what you mentioned. And being able to measure, just look at the behavior side of things. I think that for that person, be able to express themselves most authentically. I think language does have an impact on that. As we have seen in some assessment center, uh, where a Korean person behaves quite differently when it comes to speaking English and also speaking Korean, that you're really able to see a true person within that. That then, that well, they end up. It ends up not being authentic, Eric. I think you end, they end up not being themselves and not being able to really show themselves at, at their best. So it's important that they have choice. I agree. Great. I think that's all the questions we have for today. And. Uh, so the person hasn't DM me. So maybe what we can do is because I have the participant list, so I'll, I'll reach out to them. We, we, uh, we sure. after this, we have a conversation regarding the resource that we can share with them. And, yes. Uh, because I have the participant list right here, and uh, we will follow up with the questions regarding the recommendation that you would have for them. For some sure. Of those no problem at all. Great.